So let's talk about the vapor power cycles. It's our next chapter. What is this a picture of? This is a picture of a power plant that makes electricity, and it's really owned by the ratepayers in the San Antonio area. CPS power plant down at Calaveras Lake. So this is just one way that you can make electricity is you burn something, coal. How does it work? What, how, does you, how do you burn coal and make electricity? Well, that's the study of this chapter. So we start off with a review of the Carnot vapor power cycle. How many people remember the name Carnot? Yeah, where was that in chapter five, end of uh, chapter five? Please go and reread that section. I know it was very difficult to read the first time you're through it in Thermo 1, but it's going to be really important because we're going to talk about, when we talk about vapor power cycles, we'll go back and review Carnot vapor power cycle. When we talk about gas power cycle, we go back and review Carnot gas power cycles. When we go to refrigeration cycles, guess what we do? Refrigeration, vapor compression is a bedrock. It's a gold standard by which we can compare. You cannot get any better than the Carnot vapor power cycle or gas power cycle. They'll have the same thermal efficiency. Well, what are they named after? Here is the individual, uh, Sadi Carnot. Uh, the years that he lived, let's see, 1796 to 18. So he only lived way too young. He died way too young, true? And now, what else is important about this time period? Industrial Revolution. If you needed to lift anything, build anything, plow anything in agriculture or anything, how was it done? How was all this work being done up until the Industrial Revolution? Muscle. Muscle. Animal muscle and human muscle. That's the way it was done. Think about it. So now you can burn something to lift something, burn something, to turn something. It really was a revolution. So he wrote one book uh, in 1824. So, you know, that was, what, eight years before he died. So he was 28 years old when he wrote the book. And uh, it was reflections. So it's like thinking, pondering, considering on power of fire. And I covered up one word. The key word right here, but it's power of fire. So you're burning something. It's a rate, the power at which you're burning something. And what is it really doing? The rate at which you're burning something, releasing heat, making something hot, is to make something move. The motive, the motive, turning it into motion, the motive power of fire. You can still get a copy of the book translated in English from Dover as well as probably find it online. I think it's not easy reading because he wrote it so long ago and your concepts of thermodynamics have vastly improved and matured over that time period. But uh, he did some things which were really good and we still talk about them today. So there's two main points in his thought about the idealized, the perfect, you can't get any better heat engine. So first of all, what's this heat engine mean? to you. What does it mean if you talk, oh, what's a heat engine? I've never studied it. No, you studied it all in thermodynamics. You burn something to put into heat transfer into a system, and the object of that system is to convert as much of that transfer of heat into it from a high temperature source into power out. And then you have to some people say, oh, no, that's wasteful. Don't throw any energy off to the environment. Don't dump it off to a low temperature reservoir. That's wasteful. Throw, stop that. You engineer, clever engineer, design a system where this is zero and this is all, you know, it's 100% of the heat in. That's a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. It took us a while in science and engineering to figure that out, but he was on to something way back when. So he's already thinking about the best, the idealized heat engine. And there's two main points. The first point being that the efficiency is a function only of two temperatures. The only the two temperatures of the reservoirs between which it operates. They already knew that you had this temperature TH and this temperature TL. And that dictated. So if you could get a higher TH and a lower TL, especially a higher TH, 
you could get a better efficient engine. That's, that's still true. The other is that the maximum efficiency attainable does not depend on the exact nature of the working fluid. Inside of this box is a cycle. You could put water in there, steam, boil it, condense it, all that. You could put a refrigerant in there, refrigerant this, refrigerant that, refrigerant 134A, 410A, whatever, 12. There's a pile of refrigerants. You could put ammonia in there in the working fluid of the cycle. You could put air as the working fluid of the cycle. Guess what? If you're at the maximum, it doesn't matter what working fluid you use. It's irrelevant. So it's not like, hey, here's a magic you know, container of some special fluid. A lot better than water. You just switch this out with water and you'll get 3% more, 10% higher efficiency. Nope, not true. So the maximum efficiency doesn't depend. It only really depends on the two temperatures. So what is the most famous equation? The thermal efficiency, which is defined as that net power out divided by the expensive heat into the cycle, the heat engine, that's the heat engine thermal efficiency, boils down with our maximum Carnot thermal efficiency to be 1 minus T over T. Which two Ts? TL over TH. TL over TH. That's a big equation. It's a lot in the derivation. Uh, but it's very fundamental. You don't want to come out of any thermodynamics class and not know that Carnot thermal efficiency, 1 minus TL over TH. So now let's talk about the Carnot vapor power cycle. First, you're going to have components because it's going to have four major components, and the flow is going to be through each of the components. So you can put them in any order, but put the boiler, then the turbine. So steam comes out of the boiler and goes into the turbine. So those are two of the components. And what it's a little confusing, but every now and then we, we have to put states in between. So state number one is the outlet of the boiler and the inlet to the turbine. Okay. Then it comes out of the turbine. It's state number two and the working fluid, which would be something like steam. You can also have the Carnot vapor power cycle with the refrigerant. But it goes to the condenser, and then out of the condenser, there would be state three, and it goes into the pump, and out of the pump, it would go into the boiler. So what are the four components? Boiler, turbine, condenser, pump. So how many states? Four unique states between four components. And why is this an open system? Because we're going to do a control volume analysis of the turbine, then a control volume analysis around that condenser, then around the pump, and then around the boiler. What is flowing in this loop? Working fluid, M dot. So if you're, we're only going to analyze this steady state. So if 22 kilograms per second is flowing through the boiler, then 22 kilograms per second is flowing through each of those other components. It's the same. M dot's the same, flowing through. All right. So what is our major heat transfer? Well, you're going to bring in cap Q dot in the boiler. That's coming into the boiler. And you're going to reject. And right here, I'm going to just going to say it. I'm going to take ownership of the direction of that heat transfer. Instead of always having a negative, and sometimes I'll do it that way. But right now, I'm going to show it as a positive out. I'm going to show it as a positive Q dot out of the condenser. That's a, when you do analysis of the condenser, you've deviated from our traditional sign convention for that component. All right. What about for the turbine? You get W dot out of the turbine. And I'm going to deviate from the pump because we know it's power into the pump. W dot into the pump. You can put, you can leave W dot pump out of the pump and then you would calculate a negative quantity. But that's okay. Let's just work it with it this way. <clears throat> So now I got to talk about the temperatures and pressures and the conditions of the steam at each of these states. First off, the pressure at one compared to the pressure at four, is it greater, equal, or less? It's equal. Why? 
because that's our standard assumption on heat exchangers. We neglect the pressure drops in heat exchangers. Well, what devices do we see great pressure changes in? Turbine, pump, expansion valves, but not heat exchangers, right? And uh, you'll have it also in nozzles and diffusers. But uh, So right away, this is interesting. P1 is equal to P4. What about P2 and P3? So there's really only two pressures in the whole system. One is the high pressure, one is the low pressure. Is the boiler at high pressure or the boiler at low pressure? pressure. It's high pressure. And so sometimes they'll even draw a line like this and say, aha, that's the high pressure side. And we'll do the same thing in refrigeration. And this is the low pressure side. Whoops, it's kind of through the turbine, but anyway, you got the gist that the condenser, state two and three of the low pressures. All right. Now that we have a good idea of that, we think about the Carnot. The Carnot has perfect uh, components. There's the best turbine you can build, no friction in the turbine. It's completely reversible, expansion in the turbine. So what about the sigma dot in the turbine? Zero. What about the sigma dot in the pump? It's zero. So there's no irreversibilities. That's what you need for maximal efficiency. That was stressed in their Thermo 1. Now, you think about this. I also need to avoid irreversibilities in the boiler. This one is difficult, conceptually challenging. So I'm thinking about it. If I'm bringing heat, Q dot, into the working fluid, the second greatest source other than friction for irreversibilities is what? Heat transfer through a finite temperature difference. So to have no irreversibilities in that boiler, I need to bring in that heat where it's coming into the working fluid all at the same temperature as the source TH. And when you started to study thermodynamics and that was first tried to be explained to you, you'd say that's impossible. Because look at state four is the inlet to the boiler. State one is the exit to the boiler. If I'm pumping heat into the fluid, into the steam going through the boiler, state one is going to be a higher temperature. Any high school student knows that. How could you ever dream up a boiler, how it would work, such that T1 is equal to T4? You know the answer. You studied Thermo 1. How do you accomplish it? Phase change is the right, that's it, that's exactly it. It's phase change. So what is the condition of the fluid coming in at 4? Saturated liquid. And the condition of the fluid going out at 1? Saturated vapor. So it's saturated liquid and saturated vapor. All right. Now, before we get bogged down into what's going on between two and three, it's going to be the same thing. Basically, you've got to reject heat out to this low TL. And state two and state three have the same temperature. They're both at TL. How could state two and state three have the same? Is state two saturated liquid and, uh, or saturated vapor? Is state three saturated liquid? No. But they're close to it. They have a high quality at state two and a lower quality at state three. They're two phase mixtures. That's right. What are our two favorite property diagrams coming out of Thermo One? Yes. PV and TS. So we've sketched the PV. And I'll tell you right away, it's just a good review, but it's kind of a dead end. The one we're really interested in is the TS, the temperature entropy, because it's a little more uh, uh, insightful. So put our dome on it, right? What does the dome look like? And it's very skewed. It has a long tail at larger specific volumes on a PV diagram, and it's much more symmetric on a temperature entropy diagram. What's the dot at the top of the dome? The critical or the triple? Critical. It's the CP, the critical point. What's the distinction at the critical point? What do you lose at the critical point? 
If you go higher pressure, higher temperature, then the critical point pressure, critical point temperature, what, does, what do you lose the distinction between? Liquid and vapor. It's kind of a mushy cloud when it's a supercritical fluid. All right, so now what we do is we say on a PV diagram, there's two pressures. There's our high pressure, <laughs> pH, and our low pressure, PL. Both states 1 and 4 are somewhere along that line of constant P pressure at high pressure. And likewise, state 2 and state 3 are somewhere along the line PL. Where exactly is state 1 on this top line? Saturated vapor? You're right. And now over here is state two. Not it's two, state four, isn't it? There. Those are easy. Let's come back and revisit it because state three, two and three are a little harder on a PV diagram. Let's jump over to a TS diagram. We got the dome, the critical point on it. What does a line of constant pressure, high pressure look like on a TS diagram? You're exactly right. So it's it goes up, hits the dome, it's saturated liquid, goes flat across, and then scoots back up again. So this would be at P high, and this one would be at P low. All right, where is state one on a TS diagram? Right there. Where is state four on a TS diagram? Right there, because there had to be the high pressure. Now, what about state two? Where is state two on a temperature entropy diagram? And isn't this one of the key ideas, what's happening going through that turbine? And you've done enough second law analysis of turbines to know steady state, and I forgot to emphasize, what is Q dot for that turbine? Zero, this adiabatic. Adiabatic reversible expansion through the turbine means Isentropic expansion, S is constant. So state two is directly below, and it's at that low pressure. And then what about state three? Well, you almost have to think going backwards from four back to three, because it's, it's kind of awkward to think, I'm going to condense, condense, and then stop condensing at the magical point that I put it through this magical pump and end up at four. Sometimes it's easier to think going back from four down to three kind of backwards through the pump, okay? Because it's the same thing. It's isentropic uh, compression through that pump. All right. So this is what it looks like on the temperature entropy diagram. If I had to describe the cycle on the TS diagram, what does it look like? A circle? A box. A rectangle. Right? Right? Colorado or some other states that are just boxes. Now, let's go ahead and put it on a PV diagram. Where's state two? Well, it's going to expand down to this low pressure, and it's down like that, and it's not directly below. And then it comes over to state three, and then it kicks back up, and so it's, it's skewed like that. But that's state two and state three. The most important is that TS diagram. So where is the heat coming into the cycle? This one is where the heat's coming in. You can draw it as Q dot in the boiler coming in right there between 4 and 1. Where is it being rejected? Right there. That's Q dot in the condenser. Sometimes they'll draw it like this. They'll draw it lowercase qc. What is that? It's the specific rate of heat transfer, meaning the rate of heat transfer per unit mass transferred through it. So is a lowercase q condenser, is that q dot condenser divided by mass flow rate through the condenser? Yep. And so you get these, these uh, funny units of kilojoules per kilogram. So it's how many kilojoules of heat was transferred out of the working fluid in the condenser per kilogram of working fluid going through the condenser. And likewise, you can get the lowercase q of the boiler, which is q dot into the boiler divided by the mass flow rate through the boiler. All right. 
In order to analyze this problem, make a table for your properties. So we make a prop pretty table. Now, how many properties do we have? Distinct states. How many distinct states do we have that we want to get our properties at? Four states. One, two, three, four. What are our properties of interest? From experience, we know that we're always talking about the pressure, picker units, bar, kilopascal, whatever units you want, atmospheres, temperature, probably degree C. If you think you need it in Kelvin, make an extra column. Put an extra column of temperature in Kelvin. But I'm not going to do that here, interest of space. Quality, because especially for states two and three, I need to work with the quality. And then I'm really interested in that enthalpy, kilojoules per kilogram. Hey, is there a difference between cap H and lowercase h, or are they both the same? What does the cap H mean? It's the total enthalpy. And then the lowercase h? Specific enthalpy. It's per unit mass. Are these the units, kilojoules per kilogram? Are those the units of the specific enthalpy? Yes. Did you know on grading the exam, some of you are still confused? Because it's obvious. So we want to get clear exactly why do I put a lowercase h here? What are the units? What does it mean? And then the same with cap H. And then lowercase s, specific entropy, kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Now, I like to put a little extra thing out there what helps me fix the state in my mind. Two pieces of information fix that state, then I calculate the other properties. So for the first, you can just march on down. Really, it's our high pressure, P high for state one. And then that's the same high pressure for state four, isn't it? Aren't these the same pressures? Yeah. And then we have the pressure low and the pressure low. So we have just two pressures. Usually they're given in the problem statement. They could be a hard problem where you're you know, not given them and have to calculate, but it would be really difficult to do that. Basically, the boiler pressure is given, the condenser pressure is given. So what else do you know about state one? You know already the pressure, and what about state one? Saturated liquid. Almost, you can just fill it in right away. So what's the quality of saturated liquid? 100%. What is the enthalpy for the saturated liquid? H of F or H of G? H subscript G for saturated vapor. How about S of F or S of G? Straight off the table for that pressure for that steam. And then what about the temperature? How could I get the temperature? Oh, I wrote liquid. Did I say vapor? I hope I said vapor. <laughs> well, I wrote vapor here and I put it vapor there, there, there. Sorry about that. Thank you for the correction. That means you're awake and alert. This is good. All right. Do I have any other uh, problems with what I've put up so far? Does it look okay? All right. What about the temperature? It's the saturation temperature at that pressure, TSAT. How about state two now? We just walked through it on a TS diagram. What two pieces of information? The pressure? Entropy. So the pressure and entropy. Well, well what is S2? It's equal to? S1. I kind of like to draw an arrow, say just bring that entropy down. So knowing the pressure and the entropy, I can get the quality. How do you calculate the quality at state 2? Entropy at state 2 minus S of F divided by S of G minus S of F. True? Good. How do I get the enthalpy at state 2? H of F plus X2 times HFG. Yeah, so you can kind of see the pattern, how you're walking through and populating this table, learn, getting this information. What about the temperature? Is that the saturation temperature at the low pressure? Yeah. All right. You could jump to state 4 and then work back to state 3 just like we did it on the diagram. So at state four, it's the pressure 
and saturated vapor, not vapor, liquid. So it's the TSAT. Hey, are these two temperatures the same? Is T1 and T4 the same temperature? It is. The same pressure, the same temperature? Yes, that's exactly right. And then we continue and we find it's zero quality. It's H of F saturated liquids enthalpy and S of F saturated liquids entropy. Now, state three, we can finally get it backwards from four. I like to think, oh, we know the pressure. It's a low pressure and it's isentropic. So we work backwards. So S3 is equal to uh, S4, just like S2 is equal to S1. And then you calculate the next thing. You calculate X3, just like you did for the quality of state two, and then the enthalpy at three. And then you can get the saturation temperature. Are the two saturation temperatures the same at state two and three? Yeah, sure. Once I have that uh, table of properties, I want to make an extra table of the energy transfers for each component. I'm going to have to scroll down. Hopefully you have good notes. So I need to make a table for each component. Well, how many components do I have? I have the boiler. Let's start off with turbine. T-U-R-B-I-N-E. Turbine, condenser, then the pump, then the boiler. All right. And now there's going to be the possibility of two big energy transfers. It's going to be the lowercase q or the lowercase w for each of those. For the turbine, we look at that turbine and we think, is it primarily a heat transfer device or a work transfer device? So work transfer. So the q is zero. What are the units in this column again? The lowercase q? Kilojoules of heat transfer per kilogram of working fluid through the device. What about the lowercase w? What are the units? Kilojoules per kilogram. All right. Now, how am I going to calculate lowercase w, the work transfer per unit mass, for the turbine? Energy balance. First law, neglect. Well, first of all, it's steady state, no heat transfer. Neglect changes kinetic and potential energy. What do you get? So you would find that the, the power out of the turbine is the mass flow rate through the turbine times the difference in enthalpies. And so it's going to be H1 minus H2. So if I bring that M dot over, then at this W, lowercase w t, uh, this is an uppercase here, is just H1 minus H2. So it's just H1 minus H2. We go to the next component, condenser. Is there shaft power in or out of the condenser? So one of these is zero. And then we do an energy balance. When you do an energy balance for the condenser, and think about this, let me back up and scroll. Which enthalpy is higher? Enthalpy at two or enthalpy at three? Which enthalpy value is higher? Two or three? Two. Enthalpy is like energy content. It's the internal plus flow work, energy content, right? So, so basically, if you're calculating a positive Q out of the condenser, it'll be the larger enthalpy, the inlet enthalpy, minus the exit enthalpy. Whoops, H3. What about for the pump? Is there any heat transfer? No. What's it going to be? Which enthalpy is higher and lower for the pump? Is H4 higher than H3? It is. It is. And so the positive work into the pump is H4 minus H3. All right. How about for the boiler? Zero work, and it's H1 minus H4. Now, if I take... It, uh, sometimes you can sum these, but I didn't do it with the sign. What is Q net for the cycle? It'll be the Q that comes into the boiler minus Q rejected in the condenser. 
and that'll be a positive amount, and that will be the net transfer into the cycle per unit kilogram flow through the cycle. What is W net for the cycle? Work out of the turbine minus what you had to feed back to, pump, to the pump. And what will that be? That will be how many kilojoules of work out per kilogram flow through. Now, what is the relationship between Q net and work net? Is, I'm going to pause and walk around and see how you write this out. Is Q net equal to work net? Is it greater than work net or less than work net? I'm going to pause and walk around. All right, um, it's easy to watch me do everything, and I do it hopefully not without making errors, but I know that this is one of these challenging things. Well, energy is conserved. First law for the whole system. First law for the whole system. Do a large control volume around the whole system. It's not just ideal. It's got to be energy is conserved. Anyway, so we get down to our metrics of interest. What is one of the metrics, the thermal efficiency? Is that the W net out divided by Q net in? Or is it W net out divided by Q in the boiler? All right, then we have another metric of, of importance. The back work ratio, is that how much that comes out of the turbine must go back to feed the pump? And then one other metric the book doesn't make a big deal of, but it's important, it's just W net. That basically says how many kilograms do I have to flow around to get so many kilojoules out of the system? As a practical engineer, I don't, it's like you know, sending 20 kilograms to do the job that maybe one kilogram could do. And so lowercase w net is a very practical thing. So let's do a quick one. Which one? This one or that one? Right? And this is correct. And then this is a metric that we already talked about how to calculate it for work net. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop, and uh, we'll hand back the exams.